Okay. All right. I'll try to become practical at some point. Um, but I am like Alan, who is also on my doctoral committee, a theologian. Christ is commonly thought of as the new humanity, the one in whom human persons participate to find the fulfillment and flourishing of their human natures. This approach to human nature has been called Christological anthropology and emphasizes Christology as the primary lens for understanding human nature theologically. But what may be missing from this vision of humanity is a role for the spirit. Without detracting from the significance of Christology, it seems important to think about the role of the spirit in uniting us with Christ, just as Christ seemed to depend upon the spirit throughout his earthly life. This becomes incredibly important in particular for the theology of the apostle Paul. This paper, therefore, seeks to develop a spirit-infused Christological anthropology. To do this, I begin with an assessment of recent theological and biblical literature on spirit Christology in Pauline thought in particular, which seeks to prioritize a pneumatological lens for doing Christology, and which emphasizes Jesus' relationship to the spirit. I here draw upon uh, the work of Krista McCurland to show how Christ's human, humanly dependence on, upon the spirit reveals something about human need for the spirit more generally. I then connect this work uh, of the Spirit in Christ's humanity with the uh, Spirit's work of uniting the body of Christ with Christ in the heavenly holy of holies. I thus argue that humanity is created to participate in Christ's humanity by the Spirit, and that this pneumatological dimension of participation indicates a corporate dimension to participation in Christ's human nature. I conclude by unpacking some implications of this corporate participation for the metaphysics of human nature and ecclesiology. So you can see how we kind of go into the, the uh, church planting angle there at the end. Uh, I'll skip the section on uh, sort of the taxonomy of different approaches to spirit Christology and Christological anthropology. Um, we'll just assume that uh, spirit Christology is not, in fact, a heresy and move on. Uh, Paul's spirit Christology. Paul, as previously stated, develops the relationship between Christ and his spirit in unique ways among some of the New Testament authors. Many New Testament scholars point to the prominent role of the spirit in, for instance, the life and the ministry of Christ throughout the New Testament literature. Um, but it is the St. Paul who uniquely develops this relationship between the work of Christ and that of the spirit for its implications for the church. At the heart of Paul's corpus is the union of believers with Christ. For Paul, this is not merely a moral or political union, but a real union of persons, so that the very being of human persons participates and is transformed in Christ's own particular humanity. The Apostle Paul's usage of encrystal language captures this motif of Christ vicariously accomplishing things, especially those related to our salvation and resurrection, on our behalf. This is important not only for its Christological centering of the Christian life, but that the reception of these things is also done in Christ's person. Examples of this usage include... Um, I'm going to skip the quick exegetical section. That's like a whole paragraph. Uh, this kind of usage of in crystal, so specifically it's in crystal language that Paul is using, um, or in Christ's language, it indicates not simply something that we receive as an external consequence or reward for being united to Christ, but something that is accomplished by Christ himself and given to us in his divine and human person. Christ is, in this usage, both the agent and the instrument. In the act of accomplishing this work in himself and in giving himself to us, Christ's objective work includes within itself the subjective realization of this work. He enacts in his own embodied life a redeemed humanity which is then given to us in a participation in his redeemed humanity. It follows then that what we, must, that what we require for our salvation is something accomplished in the human embodied Christ. We must be united with the uh, person of Christ. We must be able to partake of those benefits in his uh, humanity bodily located with us. And yet, because Christ has ascended in the flesh, Christ remains at a distance from us. To make sense of this union over such great distance, Christ in the heavenly uh, uh, holy of holies, us here on earth, Paul employs the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as making Christ united with us even while he is bodily present in the heavenly holy of holies as the high priest. Something about David Moffat. Moving on. Uh, the work of Christ and its application to the body of Christ, who participate in him, for Paul, is inseparable from the work of the Spirit. In what follows, I will offer an exegesis of this relationship for the purpose of explicating the relationship of Christ and his Spirit. This provides a framework for understanding Christ's humanity and, by extension, our own in relation to this work of the Spirit. Paul's appeal to the work of the Spirit in uniting us to Christ by faith is an outworking of his theology of the resurrection. 
Paul asserts that Christ must be raised bodily if we are to have any sort of hope in a future resurrection life. This grounds Paul's frequent insistence on the significance of Christ's humanity for our salvation. The humanity of Christ serves as the basis for Christ's mediation between humanity and God the Father, aka the God-human word movement, the human-God word movement uh, that we heard about earlier. The apostle writes, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, all the more having been reconciled, we will, uh, will we be saved in his life. And not only is this the case, but also we celebrate in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are now recipients of reconciliation. This parallels what the apostle Paul says about Christ as the second Adam. For just as in Adam all die, then in the same way in Christ all are made alive. The Apostle Paul, Christ is enacting a new humanity in which death is overcome and human bodies are given new life. This new humanity, argues James Dunn, is a sharing in Christ's resurrected humanity beyond the power of sin and death. Christ enacts a resurrected humanity so that in our union and participation in him, we may participate in that which he has accomplished in himself. T.F. Torrance, uh, no, the other Torrance. Uh, argues to this effect, the New Testament thinks always of the resurrection of Jesus as the decisive event um, and of our resurrection as bound up with his. For this reason, the Apostle Paul attests, now Christ has reconciled you in the flesh of his body through death, presenting you all holy and blameless and beyond reproach before the Father. In union with Christ, we participate in a new humanity, one resurrected and raised with Christ in the eschaton. But if our presence with and participation in Christ is so important, how can we have such a union if Christ is no longer bodily present on earth? Christ's ascension is an indispensable aspect of his atoning work. If Christ is in the highest heavens interceding on our behalf, how is it that we can have a redeemed humanity in him? We require union and participation in an ascended and therefore distant Christ in order to live in this new humanity promised by Christ. In our participation in Christ, Paul quote, maintains the distinctions between God and the creature. While allowing his glory to be shared with them, it is covenantal and specifically related to the spirit promises of the new covenant, and it involves a particular union between believers and the Messiah realized by the spirit. It is thus here that Paul is pointing to the work of the spirit in uniting us to Christ, covering the distance between heaven and earth, between now and the eschaton. Even as Paul confesses that the salvific benefits of a new humanity are in Christ, he also states on several occasions that the gifts given in Christ are given through the Spirit's indwelling. McHabits argues that this move is justified on the basis of the relationship between Christ and the Spirit. He writes, Spirit is now related to Christ in exactly the same way as the Spirit was related to Yahweh in the Old Testament, expressed as Spirit of the Lord or Spirit of God. Paul asserts that he expects to receive fellowship through the Spirit with Christ himself. The Spirit can make Christ present to us in precisely, uh, sorry, to and in us precisely because the Holy Spirit is identified as the Spirit of Christ. Jesus is the giver of the Spirit because, and he is so because the Spirit is the essence of life with God. When Paul speaks of the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of the Son, it is to affirm that the Spirit is Christ's executive power. Said in another way, the Spirit actualizes the union of believers with Christ, our participation in him. The Spirit is the one who enables us to participate in Christ so that in participating in his humanity, we might have these salvific benefits in our own human fleshes. For one, In one spirit, we are baptized all into this one body. For the Spirit incorporates us into the body of Christ where these benefits are received. Throughout Paul's writings, this theme of incorporation is presented with multiple effects resulting from it. Two significant effects of incorporation are our union with other members of the body and the perception of salvific benefits accomplished in Christ's human flesh. Several Pauline scholars have noted the interconnectedness of incorporation into Christ's humanity and the unity between believers brought about by the Spirit. What the Spirit does, does is not simply uniting us with one another, but brings about a unity with one another that occurs in and with our union with Christ. Thus, Paul writes, the cornerstone being Jesus Christ himself, in whom the whole building is being joined together, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling place for the Spirit of God. This dwelling for which we are built together is the body of Christ. The connection Paul is drawing here between union with one another and our participation in Christ is rooted in his pneumatology. Both 1, uh, both 1 Corinthians uh, 3.16 and Ephesians 2.22, uh, Paul identifies the church as the temple of God and a dwelling place for God and the Spirit. 
But in both of these verses, the verbs um, es, este and sunoikadomineste, my Greek is very bad, with their reference, umin and umes, indicate the second person plural. However, the words for temple and dwelling, I'm not even going to try those, uh, are both singular. For this reason, several scholars interpret this as a single dwelling for God constituted by many individuals, implying an intimate connection between the unity of the body of Christ in the Spirit and union with Christ by the Spirit. Um, yeah, I'll skip some of the other exegetical stuff to get to. Paul's witness to the Spirit's unifying work includes this element of uniting believers to Christ so that they may receive the salvific benefits of reconciliation and resurrection that are accomplished in him. Thus, our union with Christ by the Spirit is entangled with, and indeed inseparable from, our union with one another in the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul connects the Spirit's work in unifying the body into a place for God's presence with his work of making Christ present to us. In reading this Pauline theme, John Williamson Nevin thus argues the body of Christ is in heaven, the believer on earth, but by the power of the Holy Ghost, nevertheless, the obstacles of such a vast local distance is fully overcome. Because of the unity we have as uh, the body of Christ is rooted in Christ himself, Paul believes that we must be united to Christ by the Spirit to have this unity. The Holy Spirit is, quote, the mode of Christ's presence with the Christian. Thus, the unifying work of the Spirit is not isolated from reconciliation with one another, which we have in Christ. Paul, in this way, offers us several interesting insights about the relationship between Christ and the Spirit. The Spirit makes Christ present to us in such a way that we may genuinely participate in him. In this union, the Spirit makes available to us the humanity of Christ in which our own humanity is changed and transformed. But this also includes, for Paul, a similar kind of unity with one another, quite possibly indicating that our reconciled humanity in Christ includes, necessarily, unity with one another. This unity for Paul is both in Christ and a work of the Spirit, reaffirming that the union of believers is part and parcel to the relationship between Christ and the Spirit. If this relationship is essential to participation in Christ's humanity as it stands at the center of Christian life, it stands to reason that it may have significant implications for theological anthropology and for how we think about the church. Um, if the Spirit is indeed the Spirit of Christ, uniting humans, the human Jesus with his people, then it stands to reason that this relationship has implications for human nature more broadly. This theological line of inquiry could rightly be called Christological anthropology, which Mark Cortez defines as, in its most basic form, the fundamental intuition of a Christological anthropology is that beliefs about the human person must be warranted in some way by beliefs about Jesus. The intuition follows from, uh, this intuition follows from, among other reasons, the centrality that Paul's writings give to the incarnated life of Christ and his atoning ministry in making humanity new. Because, as indicated in the previous section, the Spirit plays a significant role in uniting us with Christ so that we might participate in this new humanity, the unit of ministry of the Spirit ought to play a significant role in our Christological anthropologies. As the Christopher McCurlin writes, one cannot adequately formulate a Christological anthropology without a pneumatic or Spirit-emphasized Christology. Because we see the relationship between Christ and the Spirit played out in the incarnate life of Jesus of Nazareth, Christ's human experience of this relationship reveals something about human nature more broadly. For Paul, the Spirit of Christ adopts human beings into this into the, uh, the familia day, but Christ is already the firstborn of this family. As bearers of the Spirit, Christ is also the sender of the Spirit. Through this, we are endowed with the Spirit of adoption or sonship that establishes us as sons and daughters of God. So the knitting together of humanity and Christ in participation also knits us together as a family. This reflects the above considerations of the Spirit's role in union with Christ. Yet here, there is a clear distinction drawn between our status in the Spirit's work and Christ's. As Aaron Hyam puts it, although those who live by the Spirit have received the Spirit of adoption, Christ is firstborn among the adopted brothers and sisters. Paul's adoption language in Romans 9.4, Galatians 4.5, and Ephesians 1.5 is a symbol of humanly creatures' dependence upon God. While this might seem to indicate that it is only the non-Christ uh, non human beings who require the Spirit to be included in Christ's humanity, we find elsewhere, too, that Christ relied upon the Spirit as a human being. Lots of these examples come from the Gospels, but we also see it in some of Paul's writings. This does not demonstrate a lack in the divinity of the Son, but rather a feature of human nature as it is created in the image of God and fulfilled in Christ. 
It is this spirit-filled and spirit-dependent humanity in which we participate when we participate in Christ. Or as McCurlin puts it, Jesus, as a son by nature, not only depends upon the same spirit as his own, but also gives this spirit to those who become children of God. In doing so, Christ both reveals and reconciles human nature by demonstrating what it is supposed to be by embodying its uh, to, supposed to be embodying in its intended existence on our behalf. The Father, Heim writes, is willingly extending the inheritance to any son who possesses the spirit of adoption, while these passages simultaneously affirm and uphold Christ's status as firstborn. Human beings do not need the spirit because we lack firstborn status, but because the one who has firstborn status also relies on the spirit as his empowering presence. Uh, okay, I will wrap up. Um, yep. So, um, in, in essence, McCurlin's proposal is something uh, like uh, to be human is to fundamentally depend on God in the spirit in the same way that Christ did. Um, I am proposing that because the spirit is also a spirit of unity uh, of the body of Christ, that we extend McCurlin's model to also include our need for belonging to one another, our need for belonging together in community. So the fundamental need for humanity of, of humanity for the spirit is a need to participate with one another in Christ. Human persons need one another too. Our telos cannot be thought of as several discrete relationships between God and individual humans, but the formation of a community of persons, both divine and human. That we are made for the spirit implies that we are also made for such a communion. It is perhaps for this reason that when Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is, he is compelled to give two. Humanity is created to be in loving, second personal presence with God, and this entails also that we need loving, second personal presence with one another. And some brief implications for discussion. Um, one might be that, well, if we need one another to have the presence of, of Jesus fully realized in us, uh, maybe planting churches is really important. I'm sure you needed to know that before you walked in this room. Um, so in one sense, it's sort of a, a possible practical response. Um, but we also need to start asking questions about, for instance, how does the Spirit unite? At Pentecost, we see the Spirit uniting people from vastly different cultural, racial, ethnic, and gendered backgrounds, all being united. No one ceases to be who they are. They're still Jew and Gentile, um, and the Gentiles don't have to you know, get circumcised and become Jews uh, in order to enter the kingdom of God. And yet this spirit of Pentecost is still knitting everyone together in the one Christ. Um, finally, uh, well, I'll stop there and go to Jack. Thank you very much.